to everyone who's present here and the audience that's flowing in uh, we are coming to the last two panel discussions and one of the the next panel discussion is perhaps one of the most exciting ones at least personally for me uh, it's about reimagining barriers uh, while education leadership uh, is a complex matter that all of us have been trying to work towards a mission that uh, has seen a lot of focus over the last few years uh, what we want to do in the next panel discussion is unravel the idea of leadership in similar uh, yet compl complex uh, scenarios and uh, situations. And for that, we have a wonderful panel uh, that's here. Uh, I want to quickly introduce the moderator, Vaibhav, and Vaibhav will eventually lead the session. Uh, Vaibhav is a mechanical engineer by, uh, by profession and a liberal arts student, uh, but a teacher at heart. Uh, Weber believes that quality education to every child can bring equality in society. Since 2013, he has worked as a teacher, volunteer, education leader, mentor to an after-school program, content developer, and many other things. He often writes on education for national newspapers, both in Hindi and English. And he firmly believes in finding answers internally and draws inspiration from learning. Thank you so much, Vaibha, uh, for accepting to moderate the session. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Neeraj, for such a warm welcome. Uh, I think so. This this panel discussion is uh, on a very on a topic that is very close to my heart as well. Uh, we have three inspiring personalities today who who we are. Uh, fortunate enough to have their gracious presence and uh, uh, like just to start off with like uh, before this panel discussion we discussed like should I introduce them would I be able to do justice to their introduction and we zeroed in that it would be great if all three of them introduce themselves uh, in this panel discussion so just to start off we have uh, Elena with us today from Toastin we have Lisha with us today from Last Mile Health, and we have Sharmi with us today from Harambi. So, welcome all three of you. Uh, uh, it would be great if you can just introduce yourself and your work to our audience, and we can start off there uh, from like we can start from there for our panel discussion. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Vaibhav, and thank you, everyone uh, on the on the Zoom for your generosity. First of all, and you know, I'm mostly I'm the one to be honored to be sharing this uh, space and this opportunity uh, with uh, such distinguished panelists. And you know, the discussion around education and how important education is for our future, uh, of course, is so close to my heart and to the heart of Tostan. Eh? So my name is Elena Bonometti. I'm the CEO of Tostan. I've joined the organization five years ago, and I feel so privileged to lead in an organization that for 30 years has really um, supported communities at the grassroots uh, through empowering education to really develop and fulfill a vision, their vision for well-being for, the, for their future, and also inspired really thanks to that um, awareness uh, inspired the large scale movement uh, leading really to dignity for all which uh, is a translation uh, of really the importance of human rights and education in particular has a, a very important right so my, this this journey uh, resonates with my personal journey and i had the privilege to spend 20 years in africa so tostan is based in west africa and in senegal where i'm currently based and the leitmotiv has been really women empowerment, and this is one of the main uh, really uh, results of Tostan, thanks really to the empowering education uh, piece of our model. Over to um, Lisha. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much, Elena and by Bob. It's so great to be with you all. I was looking at the agenda for this convening, and I think the opportunity to be in community with so many individuals that are so passionate in their leadership about social change is just always a privilege. So I'm super happy to be here with you, Elena and Charmi. Um, my name is Leisha McCormick. I currently am fortunate to serve as the Chief Executive Officer of Last Mile Health. And Last Mile Health is an organization that is very much focused on the empowerment and education of health workers to achieve health equity. We currently work across uh, and with ministries of health and governments um, in West, Central, Eastern, and Southern Africa, 
uh, to extend health services, particularly to communities that are living at the last mile. Our work really began in Liberia about 15 years ago and has extended to actually look at the way in which community health practitioners are trained, the way in which they're able to deliver care, particularly in moments over the past two years during COVID and the pandemic around making sure that those that frequently have lacked access to services um, are in fact able to have dignified primary care. Um, and then equally looking at the mechanisms and the means through which health workers can be trained, how the policymakers and individuals that are making decisions related to financing um, are thinking about inclusive community-based primary care and also the pathways through which financing flows, um, ideally in a fashion, and Beba, I know we're gonna touch on this shortly, um, that translates non-constructive chaos into something that's a, a little bit more coordinated. So very happy to be with you all and Sharmi, really happy to turn it over to you. Thanks, Lisha, and what an honor it is to be amongst all of you, particularly you, Elena and Lisha, and thank you, Viva, for moderating in this opportunity to share um, and, and really importantly learn from all of you. Um, my name is Sharmi Surya Narayan. I'm the Chief Impact Officer of Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator. Um, I am based in Kenya, although our work really spans uh, South Africa and Rwanda, where we work to um, ensure equitable labor market access for young people that have been excluded from the labor market. Our vision really is to um, create a society that works and that is transformed and by the power and potential of young people. Um, Africa is the, the world's youngest continent and by 2030 we will have the, the largest workforce and yet there's significantly high unemployment rates across many countries and um, less than sort of viable employment for many young people across many countries. So what Harambe seeks to do is to, through partnerships, um, create a society that really is enabled by the power of young people. We do that by designing solutions together with young people and putting young people at the center of our solutions and making them sort of the architect of, of, of creating opportunities. Um, we have a network of over 2 million young people. We've enabled nearly 600,000 pathways to income generation in South Africa and in Rwanda. Um, but really, I think, you know, why I'm excited about this topic is that it, uh, we are engaging on this complex topic of systems change. Youth unemployment is a scary um, prospect for anyone to consider, but I think doing so and understanding the barriers and also um, looking at the big picture, but breaking it down as simply as possible is a, is a task that we're trying to achieve as well. So that's part of my day job. And um, I'm really excited to learn from my co-panelists. And so back to you, Baibo, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, introduction. And to start off uh, like with the topic, I think, one of the core theme that we are touching in this discussion is how do we reimagine barriers? And as all of us have been recently exposed uh, to the situation of COVID, so I would like to start off with Lisha because uh, they have been working uh, on the health services aspect. And uh, something that she has often talked about is uh, like how chaos can be constructive as well as non-constructive. Uh, so Lisha, over to you. Could you share your learnings with respect to how do you respond uh, in situations that are chaotic and how do you sort of uh, build uh, like those opportunities in like build those situations in terms of opportunities anything that I have to uh, share uh, from your experiences at last mile health uh, that would be uh, really lovely yeah over to you Nisha. Yeah, very happy then to, to respond to that. And thank you so much for the question. So I think I would point to two things. When we are collectively engaging in work that is inherently complex, working amid systems that are intersectional, um, frequently systems that are inequitable and sort of making efforts to sort of reform them and transform them and would point to two things. I would say one is very much related to moments in which we can translate non-constructive complexity into more constructive complexity. Um, and I think the second would be really having clarity of purpose in, in what we are standing for and what our mission orientation is so that amid much of the noise and the complexity that we are frequently thrust into when doing this work, um, you have an understanding of what your North Star is and of what you're driving towards. 
So I'll speak to those two points in reverse order. Um, I would say that as we kind of think about a North Star and sort of ensuring that there's clarity of purpose, with Last Mile Health, we exist to ensure that that patient out there has access to care. And everything else that we do in our work is very much driven by that clarity around what we're trying to achieve. So when we think about training community health workers, it's so that that patient is enabled access. When we think about doing health system strengthening, it's so that that community is actually included in a well-regarded and well-equipped health system. And when we think about things like financing and sort of financial reforms to ensure that the financial landscape is actually adequate and more inclusive, it's all with an end goal of making sure that that patient has access. And that sort of brings me to the, the point that I was making around the translation of non-constructive chaos into chaos. And Bob, when we were speaking, you actually indicated that there might be some corollaries in the Indian context, I think the context I'm gonna to speak to is a little bit about the work that we've undertaken with the government of Liberia. And when we began some of our work there around increasing access to roughly 1 million people who were living in a country of 4 million people generally without access to services, um, much of what we were seeing is that the fiscal landscape had been such that the 15 counties that existed within Liberia there were essentially three counties that were typically prioritized principally by donor partners. And there, and it was those three counties that actually received the financing. And that was where all of the implementing actors aggregated. So what you saw in this context was one in which, you know, there was redundancy of services um, and some kind of duplication of efforts in these three specific counties, whereas the other 12 counties went unserved. And I think it's a true testament to sort of the will of the Ministry of Health and the government of Liberia in you know, working to actually stand up a particular policy and program in which there was clarity and uniformity around the way in which community health should in fact be delivered. There was a framework and means of measurement um, in which that program was actually gonna be rolled out across all 15 counties. And then there was also an effort to actually sit down and to establish a means of coordination of some of the complexity that ex existed to ensure that each different funding entity, be it the Global Fund or USAID um, or partners at UNICEF or the World Bank, were actually able to be assigned any one or more of these 15 counties and then to work very closely with the regional arm of the Ministry of Health um, and in those counties and their implementing counterparts. So the outcome of that is actually that we today, we have all 15 counties are actually covered. There are community health services that are being delivered um, by a standardized model. Um, and some of the inequity and uh, quite frankly, sort of inefficient distribution of resources that had occurred previously has been able to be reorganized still in a complex way, but in a way that I would say is much more constructive and equitable. I hope that's helpful, yeah. Bob. Turn it back to you. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Lisha. And what I'm taking away from here is I, I think something that all of us floating in nonprofit space is keeping your customer at the center and always listening to the voice, like what is actually needed on the ground. And what I also took from you, and I would like Sharmi to build more onto this is when you talk about how do you build sort of partnerships which are effective and reduce redundancy. Uh, thank you so much, Lisha, for that. I'll move on to Sharmi and Share me uh, like what I would want you to discuss more, like picking up the thread around the lines of, uh, so how do you, uh, like one of the aspects to solve any problem is to build partnerships and build effective partnerships, reduce redundancy, build partnerships that helps you to scale effectively. Uh, would you like to share your experiences in terms of uh, like scaling collaboratively and effectively? Uh, that would be really helpful for our audience. Yeah. Over to sure, you, Shabhi. Thanks. Yes. Thanks, Faibab, and thanks, Leisha, for that really illuminating example. Um, I think, for, for, firstly, the word Harambe in Kiswahili means we pull together. Um, and although Harambe started in South Africa, we chose the Kiswahili name. Um, our founder heard it on the radio. It was during the 2010 World Cup, um, which was hosted in South Africa. And we um, decided to go with that name because really it was a partnership themed organization because we knew even at the outset that we weren't going to solve this wicked challenge of youth unemployment alone. So Harambe, which means we pull together from a Kiswahili word, which is an East African language, was born in South Africa to solve this uh, challenge of youth unemployment 
really through partnerships and it's really fundamental to our DNA. And the reason partnerships are fundamental to solving complex challenges is pretty much that we can't solve it as a single uh, organization. Uh, we have a, a saying at Harambe is that, you know, you don't fall in love with the problem, uh, or rather you don't fall in love with your solution, you fall in love with a problem. And having partnerships approach is, allows you to actually deal with complex and evolving challenges because challenges like youth unemployment change over time. Uh, so what you knew to be true in 2011 when we were founded um, is not necessarily true today. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So in 2011, we were founded in partnership with Yellowwoods, our founding organization, to solve um, what seemed to be an intractable challenge. We had lots of young people entering the labor market um, and not finding jobs and lots of employers looking for young people and not finding the young people and really going through a really complex and inefficient process to find them. At that point, um, solving for that inefficiency between demand and supply, so demand for jobs and supply of young people was about breaking down a job into its simplest components and making a job visible to a young person and legible to a young person. And on the flip side, making a young person visible to the labor market was the most critical piece. And we learned so many lessons along the way, specifically around barriers. Um, we found that the lived reality of a young person, it didn't matter that you had, you know, lots of job sites with great jobs on them. If they didn't have access to data, cheap data, they just couldn't get on the site. If they didn't have access to transport, they couldn't actually get to a job interview. If they didn't have access to an outfit, they couldn't be ready for an interview. So we broke down barriers in terms of understanding a job, broke down um, barriers in terms of making sure that a young person was ready and, and skilled and equipped for those jobs. And it was about designing for that particular source of friction. However, over the years, we've realized our partnerships with, for example, employers needed to scale up and we didn't necessarily have to just partner with, you know, banks and insurance companies and retail organizations alone. We had to partner then with um, what we call sector intermediary bodies. So we could not just work with one-on-one -on -one employers and partnerships, we could work with a whole industry such as digital, global business services, financial sectors, et cetera. Um, importantly, one of our biggest partners and um, you know, our real core support over the years has been the government. Um, a friend of mine um, says, nothing scales, no technology scales as effectively as government. Because government, especially in countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, where government touches everyone, all primary care services in, in health, in education, et cetera, is provided by government. So we had to have a really coherent strategy of working with government. Um, and we iterated on that. We partnered first with the Jobs Fund. We were a grant partner with them. Uh, we then partnered with the city of Johannesburg, one of the economic hubs of the country of South Africa, eventually Gauteng Provincial Government, and now the national government. Um, and the partnership has really taught us many lessons along the way. Um, and I think just relating to the subject in terms of complexity and barriers, relationships, trust and humility and a collaborative approach are key. Um, again, not having all the solutions, but understanding a big picture view. So looking at the system in entirety and knowing when it's a Harambe product that needs to be at the front versus another organization's product or another solution entirely. And having that systems view but making sure that you're able to actually bring the right parties to the table was a critical piece of it. And maybe just one last point um, before I hand back to you, Vaiba, is I think um, for us, our partnerships approach has also taught us that um, sometimes it is about taking the back seat and convening. And we have another saying, which is, don't think of what you need to do as an organization. Think of what needs to be done as a system. And then it allows you to put the best tools forward, regardless of what organization you're representing. We've had to shape shift in the middle of meetings, in the middle of organizations, um, et cetera. And, and really, I think what we've learned along the way is that um, it takes some of these wicked challenges everyone needs to come to the table with different competencies and everyone has, has so many different strengths that um, if you go together, you can go much farther, not just faster. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Vaiba. Yeah, thank you so much, Shami. And I think the point where you said you don't need to fall in love with your solution, but fall in love with your problem is like at the core of the work that everyone uh, like would like to take from your learnings as well. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that. Moving to Elena, I think Elena, uh, one of the key aspect in the work that we do uh, often uh, talks about like 
what are the key learnings that you gather on the way of solving complex problem and how do you sort of institutionalize them uh, as learning for the organization so would love to know from your experience like what has been those learnings that you have learned on the way and make sure that you institutionalize uh, for the organization in entirety over to you Alain. Thank you so much and thank you for, wow, very fast but very rich contribution from Lisha and Charmi. And I would like to pick on two threads that, you know, really resonated with me. The first one is, you know, what Lisha said about, um, you know, addressing how the system, actually the system is the barrier and we need to address and to reimagine that system in a way that becomes, you know, our ally, our champion. And I think Tostan was really, also born from realizing that there was a, a problem in the system and that uh, you know people were not prepared in particular women to receive uh, you know projects and they really needed to have access to information to be actually the one to lead their own agenda and um, that has been really something that we have tried to address in very different way uh, over the course of our history and then on something that Charmi said that is really keeping whom you partner with at the center. And this is also a core piece of our approach, which is really community led and which puts really the, the community in the driver's seat. It's, you know, not, you know, allowing them to find what their challenges is, what are the, the solution, because they better know, of course, what the solution to those challenges are. And so the methodology is, uh, has, has been and is always uh, uh, has been to really, uh, um, you know, allow people to imagine those situations in which, you know, they can go to levels or to situation, to solutions, uh, to challenges that they uh, could not even imagine. Eh? So I want to just start from a story and then to go back a little bit more specifically to your question, uh, Vibe, about what we learn in the process. Eh? So when I became CEO five years ago, I had the privilege to go to the field. I really wanted to learn uh, from people, from community members. Those are our partners. Those are the ones we serve and we put at the, at the center of our work. And so I was driving through the Gambia to go to Senegal, Southern Senegal, and I had the chance to meet with uh, four women and we have a wonderful video about it so a colleague of mine is going to share with you in case you want to look at it later and one of these lady Fatou Keita uh, so the four of them eh, there were six in total but the four of them that I've met personally had just been elected at the national level these were uh, some uh, Tostan facilitators and some uh, Tostan classes participants in the new the post Jame era in the Gambia. Uh, for those who don't know, Jame was a, a dictator, I would say, yes. <laughs> and um, basically the country had opened up. And so these women had participated, have had access to that empowering education that I was referring to in the introduction and felt that they were able to step into something that they could not imagine for themselves. And uh, Fatu told me, you know, I thought I, 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 I thought I was a leader. I felt that, you know, I was a leader. Uh, but, you know, women couldn't be leader in my community. And so uh, what the Torsten model did not only gave me the confidence that the, you know, the, the skills, the, the, the information that I, could, that, I, that I needed to use to articulate what I wanted for my community, but also opened the space for me and for others to accept for me to be a leader. And so in that space, uh, that space where, you know, reimagination is possible, where new roles are accepted, in that space, I could run for office and actually people elected me, men and women, because I was the most competent. And so um, this is to me, you know, an example, a very powerful example of what is, what is possible when you address, you know, systemic change. So you go to roots causes of inequalities and uh, um, access to, you know, um, to just being heard in, in, in your space. And, um, you know, so what we have learned in our journey, so that has been, sorry, that has been really highly inspiring for me. And we have thousands, actually more than 30,000 women in that situation. Some of them are leaders in their communities, some at the district level, the regional or the national level. Um, that has amazing journey of uh, empowerment, but also as really finding the right solution for, um, uh, you know, for their, for the well-being of their community. 
Um, so what we learn uh, over the process, and I will take just a few failures that make us really go further, is that we needed to be inclusive in a way that brings everyone at the same, uh, at the, in the same, um, under the same tent, on the same pace, towards the same vision. And, and that is where that space, the relational space, we call it the relational space, is very important. Uh, because it allows really um, for voices that were not heard to be heard and for people to take responsibility. And that's true for men, for women, for youth, for children. And that comes really with the power powerful instrument of human rights that we don't call like this and we introduce them in our models a little bit down the line um, and not immediately but that powerful instrument of human rights that we call dignity uh, so our vision is really dignity for all <clears throat> comes with the responsibility and so we see that community members that go through the empowering education program uh, gain knowledge about you know basic uh, knowledge about uh, about basic uh, facts that they need to make informed choices but also about their rights and and with that comes with the responsibility and so we have seen really processes in which community empower community members become really engaged citizen and are able to um, really influence the way, for example, location of resources is done at the district level, and then really goes um, uh, goes really to the next level. And we have seen it with COVID. We have seen really communities with poor, poor resource communities going out of the way to reach out to other communities to relay the good information, really to uh, to become really the champions of others. Uh, so that they can have access to the information to be able to protect themselves from the virus. So, um, another major failure that we have seen, it was really, uh, there was a failure and then we learn, of course, uh, from it, uh, was really to engage religious leaders. So, so those are the gatekeepers. Those are, uh, those again, that allow for change to happen. And, uh, you know, it's not just informing them but it's really bringing them and understanding coming from a place of respect coming from a place of no judgment in particular with regards to harmful practices we are um, known globally for our approach to end for example female genital cutting child marriage that has put as Charmi has said, trust and respect at the center of what we do. And really, again, accompany um, communities to find their way in leading towards their well-being in the way, in the pace, and in the with the solution that they think it's more aligned to their values. Eh? And so that really working on reinforcing those values and having conversation, even very complex conversation, very sensitive conversation, but bringing them back to the respect of those values and taking, of course, the courage for those communities to abandon practices that they realize are not aligned with those values anymore. So this is really reimagining solutions in complex, in very sensitive, entrenched practices. These are social norm practices and making sure that new, new beginning or new breakthrough and are possible for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for being- Over to you, uh, uh, for being so open about uh, the mistakes that you have experienced over this journey. And I think this is something that all of us should imbibe as a lesson to being very open uh, for uh, sharing our mistakes because we are not just serving our organization, but this is the responsibility we, that we have in, in, uh, for the cause of larger good. Uh, I think I, I'm drawing so many similarities uh, to the situations in India as well. And uh, what what I would want to uh, point out about some of the similarities that you mentioned is like one thing that you said about uh, involving religious leaders for stopping child marriages. Uh, then what uh, Leisha mentioned at the very beginning that there are certain pockets uh, where you have like a lot of funding being put uh, for organizations, but there are certain pockets where there, are, there is nobody serving uh, uh, the people out there. And when Shermi talked about being very customer centric and like building partnerships in a manner that are efficient, I think it's the similar parallel that we see here that government plays a huge role in terms of scaling things up. Like government is like the biggest technology that can uh, efficiently do that. So there are lots of lessons for all of us who have joined today uh, as part of 
uh, audience in this panel. I think uh, before we move on to question and answers from the audience, like there is one thread that I would want all three of you to pull uh, is around like all of us who are working in social sector uh, and especially in complex geography is uh, we are leaders in our own sense and our personal leadership style often translates into the organization that we are serving, the people that we are serving. I would want all three of you to go like one by one and we can start off with uh, Elena herself because uh, she was just sharing her experience. Uh, like what has been your leadership style and how that sort of has been institutionalized in solving the complex problem that uh, you are doing in your own job? Thank you, Vadba, for this question. And, uh, you know, it's so important to stand up and, as Alicia was saying, to have role models. And so as a leader of organization, you want to be a role model for people that are looking you for guidance. So I would say one sentence, fulfill everyone's potential. I think uh, really looking, listening, having really active and deep listening. Uh, this is what I learned from the uh, Tostan model and what I try to practice as a leader and really allow everyone to flourish, to thrive, and to really contribute at the best that they can in, in the work that we do. Um, and um, yeah, I think that is really fulfill everyone's potential and enabling, presenting an enabling environment that is allowing everyone to really blossom with their skills and also address, of course, their challenges, but really shine, shine a light on their, on their strength. Thank you. Over to Lisha, I guess. <laughs> I love that, Elena. The idea of you know helping others to lead more effectively. You know, it, it feels really resonant. I think um, I can very much relate to the idea of just the talents of the team and the communities that we have around us and figuring out ways to sort of distribute and better democratize leadership, I think has been something that feels, feels like it's been very important to my journey as a leader and the amount that I'm frequently learning from others around me. I think the other point that I would perhaps draw out is the idea of maintaining a level of clarity and discipline in, in my own work and in what we're looking to do. Um, um, you know, they, Bob, when we were sort of chatting about this panel, one of the things that I sort of drew, drew out was the specific example of some of Lasma Health's work uh, in 2014 during the West African Ebola crisis. Um, and I think this is a moment where all of us have entered into this work because we would like to be of service. You know, I think that we see these huge gaping needs in the worlds around us and are looking for ways um, to ameliorate some of, some of these needs. Um, and in that moment in 2014, as an organization, I was, I was living and working in Liberia. Um, we as an organization that had historically been very focused on training community health workers, on working with public sector, um, on working in remote rural areas, were being asked to do all sorts of things. We were being asked to run Ebola treatment units. We were being asked to manage the supply chain for the country. We were being asked to work in urban centers. And we felt very compelled to do that because it was in fact something that was needed. Um, and I think when I and my colleagues actually took a look and sort of reflected upon what we were uniquely capable of providing and doing, and sort of where we felt we had the capacity to be able to contribute in this moment of emergency, we looked at what we were really good at and we figured out how we could double down on that. So working in remote rural areas, training health workers, working with government sector, and that's where we accelerated our progress. And I think particularly in moments of chaos, the notion that you need to be choiceful and disciplined in what you decide to do and what you say no to is critically important. And I think something that we as an organization, every single time we've been able to be choiceful, we've actually come out the other side stronger, more thoughtful, and ideally providing better services to the communities we care about. So over for me, Sharmi, I think that means I get to pass it to you. Thanks, Alicia. I love that in terms of clarity, in terms of what you said, and I love what you said, Elena, as well, in terms of enabling others. I definitely subscribe to both. I'll focus on two specific lessons that we learned, that I learned specifically during the COVID crisis. So we um, were forced to pivot significantly as many organizations were um, during COVID. And I think um, March of 2020, um, or 
yeah, March 2020, it was a really surreal experience. We were about to open several centers, job sites in partnership with the Department of Employment and Labor and go live with um, physical assistance in terms of job sites. We had to pivot entirely to an online model and reconfigure. Um, two things I think in particular helped us pivot. We are an organization of 400 in South Africa and 15 in, in Rwanda. One is connection and second is sort of trust through psychological safety. And I'll talk about the second in my own team. Um, but I think with connection, we realized that people just did not know where to go and what to do. And I think COVID in particular was you know, uncertain for everyone. We created a basically a radio show, a, a daily podcast, where we said we would give information about the status of COVID in particular, but also how we could address the fears of young people. And because we are an organization that is predominantly staffed by young people, half of the 400 is predominantly young people who were formerly unemployed. It was critical for us to dispel myths, give information, provide security and information on you know, how, how to deal you know, um, and where to trust information to come from. So that, that radio show still actually exists to this day. Um, we call it Radio Harambe, we have it uh, twice a week. And we have little updates, quizzes, et cetera. We invite guest speakers um, and we, we create a, a, a community that can connect on a fundamental level, but that can also share information. And, you know, Lisha, to your point, point people with clarity to the goals that we're, we're serving. Um, it was a really powerful communications device um, to, that allowed us to just share so much information, but also create trust and connection in a, in a really difficult time and allowed us to, to uh, pivot quite quickly. The second, my, my own leadership principle is that of psychological safety. And I think for me, it's, you know, creating a space in a very difficult and uncertain time um, of being quite vulnerable and open myself. I mean, my own interaction with my team was, you know, crowded in with my kids in the in the Zoom space. And um, I had to constantly sort of navigate that sense of I'm juggling a lot and I know you are too, and creating a space of trust and vulnerability such that we were actually on a very strong foundation to be able to execute the tasks at hand, which were clearly mapped out because we created that space for connection and communication as well. Um, and it's something that I really strongly live by in terms of creating psychological safety for enabling the best of everyone, um, like you said, Elena, in terms of allowing different people from different potentials and backgrounds to thrive. So that's a quick summary, but back to you, Baiba. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, there, there are lots of threads that are being opened up after this discussion. Uh, so like just just trying to summarize what all three of you said in terms of your leadership style and learning through the journey is like while we are serving our stakeholders it's also the uh, our field our, our field team our employees our team members who are sort of responsible for the work that we do so keeping them at the center for having this strength based leadership where you can fulfill everyone's potential and also like being able to give power to the team is something uh, that I also drew from it. Uh, when Lisha talked about being disciplined, and I think one of the gut response while we are in this space of serving people is to sort of just go out whenever you see a problem. And sometimes we end up doing injustice uh, to the amount of effort it requires. I think just having that clarity often does justice to the work that we are supposed to do. And when Shermi mentioned about connection and trust, I think these are the pillars uh, uh, of the work, uh, of the effective work in this space. So thank you so much for these learnings and thank you so much for summarizing them so, uh, so basically so sharply. And like, would just like to see if there are any questions from our audience, uh, anything in the chat, uh, we can take that up. Otherwise, like I have few closing uh, questions for all three of you as well. Yeah. All right. I'll just check if we have any Q and A. Love. Do we have any open questions from our audience at the moment? If not, then like Please I can take. Go. Sorry. Please go ahead. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so as part of the closing comment of this discussion, uh, like I would want you to share for budding social entrepreneurs, budding development professionals, like what do you call as pearl of wisdom of working in complex geography uh, or solving complex problems? Uh, like what your what would be your advice 
to uh, such young professionals, development professionals, or social entrepreneurs. And we can start from Shami this time and go in the reverse order. I was really hoping I could go last, but all right. <laughs> um, no, I picked the short straw on this one. Thanks, Baiba. But um, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback on my earlier comment about not falling in love with um, the solution, but the problem. And I think another <clears throat> way of thinking about it is to not scale products, because we are all, as social entrepreneurs, we build products and we're so excited by them and we scale them. And it's about scaling the product. And sometimes funders drive that behavior, you know. Uh, looking for growth in terms of scale of products and reach, but rather instead of scaling products, build ecosystems to solve the problem. Um, so thinking of not solving, but um, and, and not not selling the product, but solving the problem by building ecosystems. So um, for me, there's sort of they're all sort of related to the, the the concept of not falling in love with the solution necessarily, but building an ecosystem to solve the problem instead. So thanks. I'll pass to um, Elena, I guess. Oh, wow. Wisdom. <laughs> we all need wisdom. Correct. <laughs> so um, I, um, you know, especially when I think about the complexity, the imagination space, um, I think I will quote something that Alicia said, the clarity of the purpose. I think it's so important to have that clarity. It's not easy to have that clarity, by the way. It's a search, it's a journey, but having the clarity around, you know, around where you're going, where you're heading to. And I think that is mainly anchored in your values. And those are your personal journey, your professional journey. So I think spending time understanding that, what is really moving you towards uh, what you're trying to achieve, I think it's important. It's not a waste of time. It's pausing. Sometimes not doing anything is better than do more. And so just pause and really anchor yourself into that clarity. And I found it in particular in that complex situation where you, you know, you're just grappling with what needs to be done. I think uh, just going, you're, you're kind of in the weeds of things. Eh? And I think I have that image of being on the balcony, eh? trying to understand, uh, maybe it's a big picture, you know, the really the systemic approach that Charmy was referring to, really climbing on that balcony and, you know, normalize a little bit, not because it's normal, not because it's not complex and not complicated, but just because you are kind of um, having an approach that is going to be constructive and um, certainly the partnership and the people involved will uh, guide you towards the solution. So the balcony and the clarity of the purpose. Thank you. Over to Alicia. This is great. I'm, I'm taking notes as I'm listening to you, Alega. Um, I would perhaps say three things. Um, care for the givers. This work is hard. And I we have updates and down notion that there are some days where you have to keep coming up. Um, and I would say the people that you surround yourself with, the communities that you're working with, um, the colleagues that you share time with um, are going to be fundamental uh, to moving your work and your vision forward. Um, and the ability to listen uh, to those that you're working alongside um, fundamentally is going to make your innovative ideas and your sense of purpose stronger. Bob, you are on mute. My bad. Apologies. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Shermi. I think like all of you summarized this whole discussion really well. Uh, and I'm taking so much from here. Like it, I was just taking notes throughout the discussion. Uh, and I'm very sure that our audience would have been doing the same. Uh, thank you so much for holding this space, sharing your learning, sharing your failures. And this has been incredibly rich for uh, all of us who have been, who have had a privilege to be part of this session. And I would just like to close, close this session on this note, on this reflective note of how you move forward with your learnings and how do you keep on listening to the people that you're serving how do you have clarity of purpose? How do you have that ba balcony view? And how do you still maintain that connect, uh, keeping the problem at the center? 
uh, thank you so much, all three of you. It, it has been sheer privilege to host this panel. Uh, and yeah, thank you to the audience as well. Have a great day, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. So Charmy, Elena, so thank good to be with you. Hi, Sanjay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Nirja. Thank you so much, Vedha, for, uh, for bringing those conversations in. Uh, Shadmi, Elena, Alicia, I think uh, just the idea of trying every day and uh, creating these uh, positive ripple effects uh, in these difficult geographies, I think there's a lot for us to learn from there. And I'm sure in our education leadership journey, uh, we can move in the similar direction and keep identifying these uh, positive critical effects in our uh, in our itself. Thank you so much for that. And Vaibhav, again, thank you for being such a lively moderator, uh, bringing these conversations live from our speaker.